Hello everyone. Um, this lecture is going to be all about the Alberta School Act. Um, it's concerning you and the law in your new career as teachers. Uh, the School Act is a pretty important document. It lays out how schooling needs to transpire all through the entire province of Alberta. So you should be aware of it. We're not going to talk about the whole thing because that would make you want to kill yourself and probably kill me. But we're going to talk about certain aspects of it. So it is the big one. The major, it's the major document that lays out how education operates in the province of Alberta. And it's broken up into different sub uh, sections. We're going to look at parts of part one on students, uh, there's a second part on schools, and then that part uh, we're going to look at different kinds of schools, like there's also private schools and home education programs, there's ch early childhood service programs, there's charter schools. We talked a little bit earlier about charters in the previous lecture. This one we'll just talk about a little bit more. Uh, you know, there's alternative programs, alternative schools. All these things are very interesting, and it makes Alberta unique. You know, you, uh, Alberta is unique in Canada in that we do have charters, and we do have alternative programs, and we do have lots of different um, ways of delivering education, or lots and lots of what they call school choice. So it's a, it's a good place uh, to be educated. And there's other things too that you know maybe are too uh, besides the point for us right now. Things about operation and management of schools, conflict of interests. We are going to look at part four on employment for teachers, right? Like I think that's probably something that you're all really wondering about. So, what are the different kinds of uh, teaching contracts that I could land, right? And um, once I get out of uh, my bachelor of education program, so we'll talk about that as well. Okay, and then there's appeals and finance and all this other stuff. We're gonna we're not gonna talk about that today, but I've just included the the listing of these items for you so that you can investigate them if that's your thing. So um, let's get down to the nitty gritty, like Nacho Libra says. All right, so the first section I'd like to look at with you is the section on students. It's section 12. Um, I want to look at what it has to say about the roles and responsibilities of students, teachers, and principals. Uh, section 12, a student shall conduct himself or herself so as to reasonably comply with the following code of conduct. See, it's not just it's not just teachers that have a code of conduct, which we looked into last time, right? The ATA code of conduct. It's also students. <laughs> students have a code of conduct. And sometimes you're like, whoa, wait a second. What's going on in my school? How come, you know, I'm held to such a high... Uh, standard of uh, of behavior, and yet you know these kids are not are not at all. So um, there is, it it is good that they you know that you know about this code of conduct, and maybe when you start out at the beginning of your um, your year with your students, when you're laying down your classroom rules and stuff, and like I used to always have a student contract with my kids. Uh, you might use this as the basis for. Um, your own student contract, right? That you want all the kids to be aware of some simple, very basic rules and expectations for your classroom, and this is good. So here they are. Be diligent in pursuing the student uh, studies. Attend school regularly and punctually. Cooperate fully with everyone authorized by the board to provide education programs and other services. Comply with the rules of the school. Account to the student's teachers for the student's conduct. Respect the rights of others. Ensure the student's conduct contributes to a welcoming, caring, respectful, and safe learning environment that respects diversity and fosters a sense of belonging. Refrain from, report, and not tolerate bullying or bullying behavior directed towards others in the school, whether or not it had occurred within the school building, during school day, or by electronic means positively contribute to the uh, student school and community okay so each one of these things you could see if, if a student were doing all those things man they'd be pretty decent right that person that 
kid would be a, a fine student in your class. Maybe, you know, not the, you know, the, the most academic kid necessarily, but someone who, at the end of high school, wouldn't be a bad thing living next door to somebody like that, would it? So there you go. That's, that's, um, that's a nice little statement on um, student conduct uh, expectations for the classroom, their code of conduct. Student um, education is compulsory too, right? Uh, and, um, you know, kindergarten right up into high school. Um, an individual who is eligible to be enrolled in a school at September 1 in a, in a year is six years of age or older and is younger than 16 years of age shall attend school, right? So between 6 and 16 education is compulsory. Now that doesn't mean that you have to be going to a public school or a private school or a uh, sec, you know a, uh, a separate school or a charter school or an alternative school. You can also be homeschooled. I've had uh, a number of students over the year who years who um, who were homeschooled for quite a long while and then I guess they maybe their parents decided oh well can't teach my kid organic chemistry. <laughs> it's beyond me. Uh, so they, you know, when high school rolls around, the the boy or the girl um, is sent off to high school for a bit um, to get the rest of it. And these students, I've often found that they're just great, right? Um, so there, there are lots of other ways of getting um, education, but you must be in school uh up to a certain age, right? At 16, after 16, you could quit. Or before six years, you don't have to be. But in between those two ages, you, it's it's mandatory. And here's a, um, a code, a kind of a code of conduct for teachers written right into the School Act. A teacher, while providing instruction or supervision, must, A, provide instruction competently to students, B, teach courses of study and education programs that are prescribed, approved, and authorized pursuant to this act, right? So, um, you have to know your program of studies, okay? You just don't make it up as you go along. You have to know what program of studies says, what are the outcomes that are expected, and the rest of it. That's what you're going to be learning in your curriculum design courses, hopefully, too, right? Promote the goals and standards applicable to the provision of education adopted or approved pursuant to this act. So that's the outcomes and expectations. Encourage and foster uh, learning in students. So, you know, you're supposed to try to figure out how can I help my students learn. Different ways that they learn. Diverse learners in your classroom. How do you help each and every one of them? Regularly evaluate students and periodically report the results of the evaluation to the students students, parents, and the board. So report cards, and not just report cards, but, you know, um, you should be able, given lots of feedback throughout the year, right? Whether in mark form or in written comments or oral comments, parent-teacher interviews, all those things. Maintain under the direction of the principal order and discipline among the students while they are in the school or on school grounds and while they are attending and participating in activities sponsored or approved by the board. So again, right, here's another gray area, right? Well, what counts as disciplined classroom? Uh, you know, my classroom, I mean, I mean, a t one teacher might look at my classroom and say that you don't have good command and control over that classroom steal, that the kids are too loud, or that they're up out of their seats, or that they're, you know, they're having too much fun or something, right? Um, or, or, you know, other things. Uh, whereas someone else, you know, would look and they'd look at the teacher across the way and you could hear a pencil drop, right? Uh, there's not a sound. So, uh, which is a better learning environment? Is, is the one necessarily better than the other, right? Well, what counts as good order and discipline in a classroom? Um, again, different teachers have different ideas about it. Uh, some people scoff at what other teachers do because, you know, it's too strict or it's not strict enough or whatever. Uh, people are entitled to their own opinions, right? But uh, generally, you know, um, there's, there's a broad range of ways to, um, to do this is what I'm saying. Um, 
G, subject to any applicable collective agreement and the teacher's contract of employment, carry out those duties that are assigned to the teacher by the principal or the board. So if you've signed on to do, you know, this or that course or these courses, or if you've signed on to, I don't know, um, you know, coach this thing or that thing or, or, or be a part of this you know, committee or that committee, then you, you kind of got to stick with it, right? If it's, if it's something that uh, you're expected to do, uh, it's part of your contract, say, then you have to do it. So just be aware. All right. Um, another thing, at any time during the period of time that a teacher is under an obligation to the board to provide instruction or supervision, or to carry out duties assigned to the teacher by a principal or the board, a teacher must, at the request of the board, A, participate in curriculum development and field testing of new curriculum, B, develop, field test, and mark provincial achievement tests and diploma exams, C, supervise student teachers. Now this is interesting to me, because I really don't, I mean, maybe it's changing, but when I was teaching, this was not at all anything that was enforced as thou shalt, thou must do A, B, and C. Like, for instance, with the curriculum development and field testing, it wasn't the case that the pr principal went around and said, steal, or whoever it was, you're going to field test this, this and this, right? You're going to, like, they've got this new provincial exam for English 30-1. And you know, we demand that you field test it in your class. No, that never, ever happened in my... Maybe it happens in other schools, honestly, I don't know. Uh, but it was it was like, you know, they'd send a general email around and say, you know, somebody from Alberta Ed is looking for classroom teachers who are willing to have, a you know, certain elements of the new um, 30-1 or 30-2 um, English exam tested in their classroom for future purposes like is any does anyone want to do that and I've done that before and nothing wrong right so but it was always left to your choice and same with this other one right like I never went up and marked provincial tests and diploma exams I was always against it I thought um, I've I mean it's changing now in Alberta but uh, when I was teaching English they were worth 50% of a student's mark and I thought that that was asinine and I still think it's asinine and I think it's bad assessment uh, it's the tail wagging the dog and I didn't want to participate in that I I, I I had a bad conscience about any idea of entertaining the possibility of going up there and just because the money was so good uh, engaging in that sort of uh, behavior. I felt it to be irresponsible, but many teachers love it, right? Many teachers love the money, first of all. They also love the opportunity to go up there and hang out with their buds because, you know, they get to see each other from all around Alberta, right? Mark and Tess up in Edmonton. And, you know, also, too, some of them even have this idea that it's somehow professional development for them to sit around marking papers. So, uh, you know, those sorts of ideas... Um, that was always left to your choice as a teacher if you wanted to go up there. I had one um, department head try to bully me into doing it, uh, but uh, you know it was it was it wasn't his business. So, but the, um, it looks like here in the school act that you know um, they've left the door open to say, okay, well, we could potentially. Uh, force you to go and mark provincial achievement tests if we wanted to. It's it's right there. It's right there in the school act. It's funny that they don't do that because you know um, it costs a lot of money to pay teachers who choose to to go up there and mark. Well, why why would you? I mean, I guess if you wanted to be more draconian, you could say let's just force everybody to mark the darn things um, and be done with it. And then we don't have to pay anybody anything extra. Although I'm, maybe there's contractual obligations around that too, somewhere in another uh, component of the legislation. I don't know. And then supervision of student teachers, like that's not forced on anyone anywhere. Like I don't, I don't know of a single instance where somebody is forced to have a student teacher. That would not 
work very well at all either, right? Because definitely when you're a student teacher, you don't want to have a partner teacher who has been forced to have you in his or her classroom. So, but that's written in there. If they wanted to do that, I guess they could force partner te or teachers to take student teachers. So there you go. Principles. Section 20. A principal of a school must uh, provide instructional leadership to a school. Uh, ensure that the instruction provided by the teachers employed in schools is consistent with teacher courses of study and education programs prescribed, approved, and authorized pursuant to this act. See, here's this is interesting. Um, one of the court cases I want to look at with you folks um, when you look at litigation is the old um, uh, Keekster case, where Keekster was this... Um, this teacher in the 70s, uh, 1970s, and I guess in the 80s there, at the earliest part of the 80s, where um, he was teaching his kids in his social studies class all kinds of Nazi rubbish and anti-Jewish uh, lies and just horrible stuff that he was feeding these kids. And he was like, you know, um, getting all this rubbish from all this anti-Semitic literature and he was, you know, forcing the kids on pain of a bad mark to spew this back on their papers. And, um, I was reading a book and, uh, I, I encourage you guys to read it too, by, um, a really excellent historian out here. His name is David Berkison. I think he's got the order of Canada. He's so good at what he does. Uh, one of his earlier books is all about the Keekstra affair. And, um, he mentions that, uh, Earlier, um, this is the 1988 version of the School Act, but earlier versions, particularly in the 1970s, this section on principles was so vague. Like, basically, principles were just teachers who were appointed to a position of leadership, and it was left wide open. And it wasn't said what principles really had to do. And so principles, I mean, not everywhere, right? But a principal could if he wanted to or she wanted to, just not really pay much attention to what's going on in his or her school, right? With regard to how people are teaching and if they're following the curriculum, you know, if you're actually teaching the social studies curriculum or if you're just propagandizing Nazi rubbish, right? Uh, so um, this Keekstra uh, court case was really, really important uh, for a number of reasons, right? Um, it made people in Alberta hyper crazy sensitive to the need for teacher accountability, right? Teachers can't be trusted. Uh, they have to be held to account in, in everything. Uh, but also, um, you know, the idea that principals, they need more direction on what they must do. So this, this section of the act, uh, gives a lot more direction to principals. So I'm going to just leave it here and you can pause it if you want to read through it, but we're going to skip through it now. Um, because I imagine most of you aren't immediately going to become principals in your school. Okay, this is interesting, folks. Uh, this is really, actually, really cool. Um, Alberta has these alternate schools, right? Alternative schools. And I think we're the only place in Canada that, that has them, right? So alternative programs mean an education program that, A, emphasizes a particular language, culture, religion, or subject matter, right? This is cool. This is a public school. So um, here you can have an alternative program. It could be a sports school, right? It could be an all-girls school. It could be a school devoted to music or to, um, oh, like um, maybe, maybe it's a school that is helpful for people who come from, I don't know, like a Middle Eastern background where... Uh, you know, there's a kind of a culture that uh, you're inviting people into Canada um, and you're trying to um, um, organize school events in a way that um, fosters Canadian citizenship or something like that, right? Or maybe maybe it's a religion, right? Um, like a classic example in, in, Can in uh, Alberta would be, you know, south of, uh, in southern Alberta, there are lots of Hutterite colonies, right? Um, and so Hutterite people, um, they need their kids educated too. Um, you, you know, they, they have certain ideas about how education 
isn't necessarily a good thing for kids and that uh, it's best that they don't get too much education. But nonetheless, the idea is that, um, you know, if you're going to have an education for how to write students, the only way that that's going to happen is if they get their own school because then they can, you know, it can be organized around their own religious community and their own ideas of and values and so forth. And it's really important that everybody gets an education, right? So in Alberta, we've got these alternative programs and alternative schools. And that's one thing you can do. It's kind of neat that, um, you know, you can have a religious-based school within a public school system. Um, so it's responsive, right? It's, it, it allows for response, responsiveness to community needs. I mean, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution in Alberta. I think it's pretty neat. Um, also, it might just be a, a school program that follows a particular teaching philosophy, right? So it might be, um, you know, all around a particular, like maybe even like a Montessori school, right? Or like, uh, I don't know, like they don't have this yet. Although I know up in, towards Edmonton, there's a school that does contemplative education. Uh, but, you know, you could potentially have an alternative school that would be all focused around contemplative education practices or something like that, right? But it, it's something that would be a different sort of an approach to education that wouldn't be run-of-the-mill or wouldn't be what would be offered generally everywhere else. Okay, so um, it's not, it uses a particular teaching pro, uh, philosophy, but that is not a special education program, a program referred to in Section 10, or a program of religious education offered by a separate school board. All right, so in other words, um, if you wanted to have a Catholic school, well, Catholic schools already exist as separate schools, so an alternative program wouldn't be that. Do you understand? Number two, if a board determines that there's sufficient demand for a particular alternative program, the board may offer that program to those students whose parents enroll them in the program. So um, an alternative program can actually come from community interest. You know, maybe there's a whole bunch of parents in your particular community or city or district that are really interested in some kind of particular, you know, aspect of education. And they want to have a school that's devoted to that. And if there's enough of them, you know, this, this sort of thing can come up. A board that offers an alternative program shall continue to offer the regular education program to those students whose parents do not enroll them in the alternative program. So, in other words, if you're going to have an alternative school, you also have to have the alternative to the alternative school, which is the regular school, right? You can't just say, well, all that's available to kids in this area is the alternative school because it's not really an alternative is it and the kids who don't want that alternative and just want you know the sort of school that is more maybe regular or more run of the mill they won't have that and that will suck for them so when you set up an alternative school or when there is an al there also always has to be an alternative to the alternative program uh, number four, if a parent enrolls a student in an alternative program, the board may charge that parent fees for the purpose of defraying all or a portion of any non-instructional costs. That A, may be incurred by the board in offering an alternative program. Like, there may be additional costs. If you're going to have an alternative program, we need this thing to do with non-instructional costs, or this other thing, or this other thing. And so school fees. Like, out here in Alberta, there's school fees for everything, like, at the high school, the kids were always having to pay school fees. I know, uh, I, I don't have really positive feelings about that personally. I mean, when I was a kid growing up in Ontario, we never had school fees. Uh, we never paid for anything. We never paid for the school bus. We never paid to sit and eat our lunch at school out here. Any of you who are parents, you'll know this, right? You pay for everything. It's pay as you go. It's like, that's the way Alberta is, right? We It's user pay. So, but... Um, non-instructional costs only, and are in addition the, to the costs incurred by the board in providing its regular education program. So, alternative schools, alternative programs, written right into the school act, very interesting. Suspension. Um, this is interesting for you to know about, uh, because, you know, I don't think that suspensions happen too much with elementary kids, but you'll see it happen in uh, high schools, in junior high schools, but in high schools, 
So a teacher or a principal may suspend a student in accordance with subsection 2 or 3 if the opinion of the teacher or the principal, uh, A, the student has failed to comply with section 12. So that's that student code of conduct, right? The student has failed to comply with the code of conduct. Uh, the student's conduct, whether or not the conduct occurs within the school building or during the school day, is injurious to the physical or mental well-being of others in the school, right? If it affects others negatively, a teacher may suspend a student from one class period. Now that's interesting, right? So you as a teacher, if, I mean, when this happens, say, okay, say you're an English teacher or you're a math teacher or you're a science teacher, you're a high school teacher, one of the kids in the class tells you to go fuck yourself, right? Um, that's time to say, okay, time for you to go. Um, you know, that's not appropriate. We can't deal with this right now. I have 36 other students I have to attend to that poisons things. You're going to go to the office. All right. So you, you don't allow them to be in your class anymore. That's a kind of a suspension for one class period, right? That's all it is. You're allowed to do that. That's written right into the act. If that wasn't there, then I guess, you know, anything that happened, you wouldn't be able to get rid of a kid in your class. But a principal may suspend a student from school or from one or more class periods, courses of education programs, or from riding on a school bus. God, I got suspended from riding the school bus when I was a kid once. I didn't even do anything, which all the kids say, right? Uh, and a principal may reinstate a student suspended under subsections 2 or 3. So when a student is suspended under subsection 3, the principal shall forthwith inform the student's parents of the suspension, report in writing to the student's parents all the circumstances respecting the suspension, and if requested, provide an opportunity to meet with uh, the student's parents and student. Like, I mean, this is what this, the principal does, but even when I would have one of these run-ins with a student where you just had to get the kid out of your class for whatever reason it was, whether it was some kind of a, um, you know, a, a offense, like, a, you know, some kind of an oral abusive thing, or whether it was physically violent, or whether it was just really extensively disruptive or hostile or something like that. I used to always have the kid take with him or her uh, to the office a sheet that would allow him or her to write down, or it asks them actually to write down what happened, right? And it, it would give them a series of questions that they need to answer. And then underneath that, I left a spot for me to answer in my own words what happened. And then underneath that, there's, there was often a spot for um, notification of parents and that sort of thing. So I think it's good not just for parents and for principals to have things in writing, but also for us uh, in those instances. It keeps a little record of what happened. And it's really good learning for the kid too because the kid writes down what he or she thinks happened. and what. But then when they get to see what you said or what, what actually really happened, um, in the class, right? Because ostensibly you'd be more aware of, you know, what's happening in your classroom than necessarily the kid. Maybe not, but um, anyway, the difference in points of view of perspectives can be quite instructional, both for the student and for you, I suppose, uh, in some certain circumstances, maybe where, you know, you failed to see something about what's going on. Okay, there's more here on suspensions. Um, I'm not going to read all through that. You can pause the um, YouTube lecture and look through that more if you'd like. Now, expulsions, right? So, on considering the report provided to it under Section 24, 6B, and any representations made to it under Section 24, 9, the board may expel the student if the principal has recommended uh, an expulsion, and B, the student has been offered another education program by the board. So you get kicked out of one school. Um, you can only do that, I guess, if if um, there's another place where or another option for the kid, right? So maybe it's another school that'll take him or her. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a kind of a distance ed thing too. There's a lot of that now where kids can um, do you know, their, their schoolwork over the computer, on the internet or something like that. Um, anyway, different arrangements, because you can't, like, it's, it's mandatory that kids go to school, right? So you can't just expel a kid. That, 
that con conflicts with mandatory education, right? There have to be in place um, provisions for the student's education. Two, an expulsion must be for a period of more than 10 school days. Three, when a student is expelled under this section, the board shall forthwith notify in writing the student's parents and the student, if the student is 16 years of age or older, of the expulsion and the right to request a review, right? So you can grieve, I guess, an expulsion, right? If, if you, you, you know, you don't feel like it's a fa fair or whatever. Okay, so these are important aspects, um, and they'll happen from time to time. I really don't think that expulsions are, are at all um, as common as they once were. Um, I think that uh, they're few and far between these days. And I know in some jurisdictions across Canada, uh, suspensions also have been taken out of the hands of um, uh, principals. That they're they're handed over to boards, and then you can imagine if if um, you have to have some big administrative board dealing with suspensions and expulsions, and you know students or principals' hands are tied to be able to do anything, and you've got you know 60, 70 schools in district, and you've got you know um, all kinds of uh, behavioral uh, or misconduct difficulties and challenges. You can just imagine how the red tape piles up and how uh, things grind to a halt in such a situation. So, uh, different. I think probably different jurisdictions across Canada have organized to deal with unfortunate things like suspensions and expulsions, uh, better or worse, depending on um, you know what province you're in. Okay, this is a new one, folks. Um, it was. It was. Uh, a recent development in Alberta and kind of a controversial one so I thought I would I would make known to you because maybe some of you were wondering what happened with that um, it was a little while ago um, uh, I think first it was under Alison Redford her her government and then she got thrown out of office uh, I don't know and then and then um, the next fellow came in, Jim Prentice. Uh, he was he was sent to deal with it, and you know he, the way that he dealt with it, many people really weren't too impressed with it. And it's like, well, what ended up happening with it? Here's here's what it looks like in law now. So the controversy was all around gay straight alliances in schools, um, and you know certain certain um, parents, right? They're um, you know, they have certain religious persuasions that lead them, I guess, by dint of their, uh, you know, religious beliefs to think that um, gay and lesbian people somehow are doing something bad by being, or acting upon their gayness or their lesbianness, if those aren't words. Uh, but, uh, you know, therefore, that you know, the, this has no place. These sorts of things, these clubs, have no place in a school. It's a public school, and uh, you know, I don't want my kid exposed to blah blah blah. And uh, or or like, say you're in a say you're in a Catholic school, right? And uh, Catholicism, you know, Catholic doctrine has certain things to say about um, um, same-sex uh, relationships and and certain sexual um, uh, un, um, proclivities or dispensations, even even heterosexual dispensations, right towards uh, uh, promiscuity and things like this. Anyway, uh, lots and lots of hullabaloo around this last year and the year before on gay straight alliances. Uh, they weren't going to be allowed, and then they were only going to be allowed if. He went right up the food chain to the minister, and the minister agreed to it. And anyway, it goes around. But here's here's what it ended up looking like now. Um, there's a section right in the school act on support for student organizations. So, if one or more students attending a school operated by a board request a staff member employed by the board for support to establish a voluntary student organization or to lead an activity intended to promote a welcoming 
caring, respectful, and safe learning environment that respects diversity and fosters a sense of belonging, the principal of the school shall a. permit the establishment of the student organization or the holding of the activity at the school and b. designate a staff member to serve as the staff liaison to facilitate the establishment, the ongoing operation of the student organization. Okay, so for the purposes of subsection 1, an organization or activity includes an organization or activity that promotes equality and non-discrimination with respect to, without limitation, uh, race, religious belief, color, gender, gender identity, right? There, that's, that's an important addition. Gender expression, physical disability, mental disability, family status, sexual orientation. That's an important thing that's added. Including, but not limited to, organizations such as gay, straight alliances, diversity clubs, anti-racism clubs, and anti-bullying clubs, right? So they've put it right in there. It no long, I mean, case closed, right? There was so much controversy uh, on the one side and on the other side. It was such a divisive issue. Finally, this is what it came out. It looks like a pretty decent law, all things considered. Uh, and then this, the third part of uh, Section 16. The students may select a respectful and inclusive name for the organization, including the names Gay Straight Alliance or Queer Straight Alliance after consulting with the principal. So, I mean, it's just like any other club. You have to consult with the principal about what the name of it's going to be, right? Um, I mean, I don't think that that is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I know <laughs> I, I went to McMaster um, University when I was an undergrad, and um, one of my friends at the time, he lived in uh, the Bates residence, which is like one of the, the dorm um, residences where they have uh, a kitchen and things like this. And uh, his his roommates were all swimmers on the swim team, and at the time, uh, their swim team called itself the McMaster Baiters, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, these sorts of names now, I guess, uh, you know, they're 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 off color, uh, they're un unacceptable. Um, so it it's not a bad thing in a way that you know when you name a club that you have to first of all get some input from the principal. It could be really good. Like if the principal sees that, um, you know, there might be some problem with a name that might, you know, he or she could give some good feedback and then the kids might say, oh yeah, that makes good sense. Like, I don't know if you remember back in the 90s when the Conservative Reform Alliance <laughs> in the West out here after the Reform Party was starting to fade off they wanted to merge or the the reform party wanted to merge with the cons the progressive conservatives and they called themselves the conservative reform alliance party which is sort of from the crap party right i mean it, it would be good when you're naming your group to get some outside input because not every time are you going to see oh yeah that's really dumb <laughs> you know like we shouldn't we shouldn't name our club that because it could offend this group or you know it could bring you know bring condemnation down on us too. So the other thing that I wanted to highlight here too was um, it's not just gay straight alliances, it's also um, bullying, bullying um, clubs too, right? Or uh, rather not bullying clubs, anti-bullying clubs. So uh, a new section of the the act this year is bullying awareness and prevention week. So I mean when you're doing your uh, lesson designs, your curriculum design, and, you know, one of the things you probably want to think about in the third, you know, planning for the third week in November is, you know, is there some connection that I can make to bullying awareness? Um, it's written right into the act now. So uh, it's it's something that we should be thinking of. How do I provoke awareness about bullying? Not just face, like when, when I was a kid, you know, it was all face to face. Now large part of bullying is all about getting on the internet and saying horrible things to each other or or texting people and saying horrible things about people and and it's it, bullying has changed a lot it's become a lot more um, electronic so and they've even included uh, if you want to know what bullying is if you want to talk about legal definitions of bullying I've included the legal definition out of the act on this slide for you down below so have a look at that 
Okay, different options for education available in Alberta. So we've talked about just the regular public schools. We've talked about um, uh, separate schools. We've talked about alternative schools, which are public schools that just have alternative pri programs, right? It's also private schools. So private schools, are they're written right into the Act. And there's also home education programs, right? So if you want to homeschool your kids in Alberta, go right ahead it's just be aware that uh any you know that you're not given free reign to do so that whatever kids are taught in a home in their own home um it's you're still held to the program of studies you're still held to the same standards and also you're going to be there's going to be some supervision of your your homeschooling program uh, by the board or the private school or whatever. It, it, in other words, you're not left to your own devices. Someone at some point is going to come by and see how things are going. All right. So um, there's always levels of accountability, even when you teach your own kids. And once again, we've talked a little bit about charter schools. Um, charter schools are a unique thing here in Alberta. Uh, they don't have them anywhere else in Canada. They're all through the United States. Uh, it's a public school. Um, but it's a, it's a it's a different kind of a school in as much as uh, we mentioned earlier that the union uh, ATA uh, can't help you in the, in in a charter school if you get in any any trouble or if someone comes after you they can't help you um, and also charter schools because you know they they're not unionized they have more control over who they hire. They have more control over who they fire, not just for teaching positions, but, you know, if they want to have a, a light bulb in the school changed or if they want to have the floors waxed, they don't have to go to um, someone who is part of a union or someone who's part of, uh, you know, the maintenance uh, group. They can go and they can hire somebody, you know, maybe the guy who lives next door, uh, you know, they can hire him if they want or the lady who lives down the the road the other direction maybe she's the person who can help them with this other thing and so yeah they're they're given more freedom as to who they can who they can hire and that's a cost i guess it's a cost saving measure as well so application 31 a person or society may apply to the minister for the establishment of a charter school see it's not a school board it's a person or a society right that, that um, applies for a charter school to be operated and incorporated under the Societies Act or a company, right, registered under the Companies Act. So those are the people or groups that can have a charter school started, not, not a school board. An application may be made by or to the minister only if the board of the district or division in which the school is to be established refuses to establish an alternative program. This is an interesting uh, section here, folks. So, um, in other words, the only way that a charter school should be allowed to exist at all in a jurisdiction is if the people say, you know, they come and they say, well, we want to start, say you want to start a hockey school, right? You say, this is, these are all the good reasons why a hockey school would be so awesome for kids and why the learning is so great. The first thing that has to happen is that has to be offered to the local school board and say, within the local school board, do you guys want to do this? Do you want to have, do you want to take on the responsibility for starting a uh, hockey school, right? And, and, and if they start one, if they say, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do that. I'll steal your idea and we'll do it. Uh, and the, they make a um, an alternative school out of it, then you're screwed as a charter. You can't do it. But then it doesn't matter anyway because you've so the purpose has been served, right? Um, but that's the idea is that, uh, in a way, first dibs should go to an alternative school solution over a charter school solution. First dibs should go that way because, you know, it's more... It's more fair ostensibly to the teachers uh, who are ATA members and um, there are certain checks and balances that are afforded uh, in, uh, by that system that are not brought to bear in a charter school system. Okay, so the, the only way you can ever have a charter start is if no one else wants your idea. And then if you can show that enough 
people enough interest in the community in that idea for the school and you can show that it has you know longitudinally that it's going to be a good school and that it's going to improve education you know not just in your community but it's going to improve education across the province and stuff uh, then you can have your charter all right so uh, that's an that's an excellent section to be aware of Section uh, 32, the minister may establish a charter school if the minister is of the opinion that the school will have significant support from the community in which it's to be located. Like, it's no good to start a charter if no one wants to go to it, right? Or the program to be offered by the school will potentially improve learning of students as it is measured by the minister in schools operated by boards that are not charter schools. So it can't just have an effect on school, your own charter school, I mean, that has to be shown, so there's this idea of accountability, right? Like, every year, we're, we're, our students are getting better, and you find different ways of showing how students are always... It's a lot of advertising and rah-rah, sis boom ba about how great we are at charters, right? Like, finding as many reasons to toot your own horn to show how you're getting better and stuff like that. That's really important. That's the idea of accountability. But not just at your own school. See, in this section, it's saying... Uh, your school, your charter, charter school is actually beholden in order to exist to have an effect, a measurable effect on schools outside of itself. So the regular schmegular public schools, it ought to be teaching them a thing or two about how to teach. See? And then C, the program to be offered by the school is not already being offered by the board, the public school district. So one of the ways that, you know, uh, you can get around having charter schools crop up, uh, if you're kind of like, you know, a weaselly-minded uh, school board person, is you can say, well, you know, uh, they want to have an all-boys school. Well, we'll start an all-boys school. And so they can't have it because it's already offered, right? If it's already offered, then you can't have a charter school. So that's, that's, that's the only way. Uh, that you can have a charter school start as if the other people don't want to have it. Now, uh, Section 34.3 is, um, is important. You can't charge fees, all right? Um, you know, non or instruct you can't charge instructional fees to go there. And it's not going to be affiliated with a religious faith or a denomination, okay? So it's unlike... It's unlike an alternative school. Like, alternative schools have lots of different reasons for their existence, but one of which they're allowed is religious faith, right? Think of the Hutterite example I gave you uh, in that lecture. Um, here, it's the same, it's the same thing. You can't, you can't organize a charter around a religious faith, whereas in an alternative school, you certainly could uh, if, the, if that was important for that particular community, okay? So what about controversial issues in schools. What's the act have to say about that? You know, here you have Lucy. This is a funny one from uh, Peanuts. Lucy, um, uh, or rather Sally, sorry, comes to Charlie Brown, her brother, and uh, she calls him way off into some secret corner of the house. Wants to tell him a secret about how they prayed in school today. <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid in Ontario and in public school, we started every every day uh, with prayer, um, and that was not at all weird in a pu in a public school. It was um, it was just standard practice. And then in uh, 1988, a bunch of uh, there were there were some uh, court some big court cases that came down that banned that practice. Um, so you know certain controversial issues in schools. What's the act have to say about those things? Well, this is interesting here. Um, in the School Act for public schools, it says, this is, this is interesting, 50-1, a board may, A, prescribe religious instruction to be offered to its students, B, prescribe religious exercises for its students, C, Prescribe patriotic instruction to be offered to its students. D. D prescribe patriotic exercises for its students. C. Or sorry, rather E. Permit persons other than teachers to provide religious instruction to its students. Again, like, <laughs> that was not 
out of the ordinary when I was a kid in Ontario. Um, we had, let's see, we had um, every morning school prayer. There was also typically a Bible reading that they gave. So, um, you know, uh, it would be something real short at the beginning of the day. And then I think either once or maybe twice a week, but definitely once a week, we had a religion class. And the religion class was administered by uh, um, a lady who wasn't a teacher. She was just from the local church in our area, and it happened to be a Baptist church. Um, so what she did is she came in and she gave us Bible drills. So we learned all the books of the Bible. <laughs> we could recite them. Uh, and we learned a bunch of the uh, Bible stories, which actually were really helpful because later on when I was, you know, reading and learning all about literature, I could get the biblical allusions. And nowadays, when you get in a class with kids and you're reading Shakespeare or you're listening to some rock song, and you say, does anybody know where that comes from? Nobody has any clue what any of the uh, literary allusions are anymore. But um, these were these were things that were just accepted. Uh, but ever since, um, you know, the Zylberberg case, uh, in 1988, I've just got a little gloss of it there too. And there's also another one, the Elgin County, uh, case too. That's another one. Things like morning exercises where, you know, you have, uh, prayer, like a, a brief prayer at the beginning of a class. Like we used to do just the, our, our father, um, or, um, you know, the, the idea of having weekly religion class and the religion classes again when I was a kid just because of the kind of community we lived in it was a rural farming community in southern Ontario and it was uh, you know it was it was it was all taught by Baptists so, so you know you didn't learn about any other religions but these things have stopped because people just said well it has no place in a public school and when kids are forced you know, to, um, I mean, no one, no one forced anyone. What, what ended up happening, and it was written into the legislation back then, is, is uh, you know, you would have morning exercises where there'd be O Canada. Every day we'd sing O Canada. Uh, there'd be a prayer. And then once a week or twice a week, there'd be religion or something like that. Um, anyone who didn't want to do that, they just opted out, right? So in, in our community, some of my friends were Jehovah's Witness and they, the girls, the two girls who were Jehovah's Witness, they just didn't, they didn't do that. So, O Canada and Lord's Prayer and stuff like that, they'd just go out in the hall and they'd wait until it was done and they'd come in, right? Or uh, when uh, the teacher, religion, uh, and the religion teacher person would lead us in that, they'd just leave, right? And they would go and you know, work on other things in another class, and then um, they would come back when we were done. Um, so, but this these practices um, in the late 80s became unconstitutional because it was felt that th that doing that would 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 sideline um, and alienate kids. Uh, that it was somehow harmful, detrimental to them to have to 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 sing to single themselves out to say I'm not willing to follow the crowd on this, right? And so that was and and they just stopped the practice. So it's interesting. It's it's still on the books. It's still on the books that you can do this, but in practice, it it never happens anymore in public schools. Like it just. It's not, it's not something that happens. I mean, obviously here, it, it works well enough. Um, you can see how this would work well enough at a, in an alternative school, right? Um, so you've got a school, like one of the Hutterite schools, right? Or even, just even last year or the year before, down in Tabor, Alberta, there was a school in Tabor where um, the kids were doing um, school prayer in the beginning of the school day. Because it's it's written right into the act that you should be allowed to do that, and one of the kids' moms had a real serious difficulty with that, and I I tried to I I tried to find out what exactly was said by the teacher. It, it sounded like she was saying that her child was punished for not 
you know, standing up for prayers or doing prayers or something. And I wanted to know what the specifics of the court, uh, of, of the, of the case were in the school. Uh, I wrote several emails and stuff. No one ever got back to me. So I guess they don't want to, they don't want anybody to know what the specifics were, but, uh, needless to say that practice, because it hit, uh, at least provincial news. I don't know if it made it to international news, but provincial news, it was everywhere for a couple weeks there. Uh, and then Tabor decided they weren't going to, they weren't going to do that anymore. So, uh, these practices have basically stopped, but there you go, right in the school act, you can see that, um, these things are still entertained and they're still left as possibilities. And, you know, in, in some schools, like, uh, I mean, a Hutterite community, obviously, right now, an interesting one is I wonder what's going to happen with patriotic exercises, right? Again, when I was a kid every morning. We had patriotic O Canada. Uh, at my one school, we used to have um, O Canada once a week. And at my other school, I don't remember O Canada ever coming up. This was when I was a teacher, right? So I was teaching at my one school in the high school. Once a week, at the beginning of the week, we would sing O Canada. And then at the other school, it never got sung. The only time they ever sang O Canada was at the big student assemblies, so for Remembrance Day or for, you know, when they had a pep rally or something like that, everybody would stand up and sing O Canada. But, you know, so different schools handle it differently. It's not um, something that you have to do. Different administrators decide, you know, they want to do it or they don't want to do it. So, but it's interesting, like, that it's, it's still, that that's felt that it's okay because there are plenty of people, plenty of people, not just Jehovah's Witnesses, but lots of other folks who, you know, what, I, 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 why should I sing this silly song, right? Why should I, you know, this, I mean, Leo Tolstoy, if you want to read a wonderful essay of his on patriotism, uh, I've, I've read that um, with my students in uh, high school when we were studying um, imperialism and, and um, uh, you know, warfare and these sorts of things. And it's, it's a great essay, you know, well, what is patriotism? And so some people, it's just conscientious objection. You know, well, why why should I be so praise were you know praise up or or be willing to um, stand on guard for thee when I look at what happens? Maybe I disagree with what my country is up to or something like that, right? So it's funny how um, I'd be interested to see what's going to happen uh, with with those sorts of uh, exercises in the future in schools as well. Okay, section two, where a teacher or other person providing religious or patriotic instruction receives a written request signed by a parent of a student that the student be excluded from religious or patriotic instruction, both the teacher or both the teacher or other person shall permit the student either to leave the classroom or to remain in the classroom without taking part. So again, that's that, that's that opt out that, um, they had when I was a kid in Ontario in the 70s and 80s um, that has gone by the way of the dodo and the court cases, Zeibelberg and Elgin County and these things have basically said no, no to that. Um, but it's still, it's still on the books. And if you want to read more about this kind of contentious issue in education, down at the bottom you can see I've written a, a, a series of articles here on on that that's to appear shortly in um education law journal so maybe that's something that you'd be interested in okay notice to parent um this is a new section as well in 2015 you know where'd this come from let me read it to you section 50.1 a board shall provide notice to a parent of a student where courses of study educational programs or instructional materials or instruction or exercises include subject matter that deals primarily and explicitly with religion or human sexuality. 51-2, where a teacher or other person providing instruction, teaching a course of study or educational program or using the instructional materials referred to in subsection 1 receives a written request signed by a parent of a student that the student shall be excluded from the instruction course of study education program or use of instructional materials the teacher or other person shall uh, permit without ac ac academic penalty to leave the classroom or to remain without participating right um, 
And then it says down below that in part three, this section doesn't apply to incidental or indirect references to religion, religious themes, or human sexuality in the course of study, education program, instruction, or exercises. So where'd this come from? This is a strange Alberta phenomenon here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in other words, if your teaching involves you discussing explicitly as part of your educational program something that has religious content something that has content about you know sexual um, human sexuality uh, which also includes matters like whether or not you're gay or you're straight um, you you can get in Alberta you can get in a whole heap of trouble if you don't first announce beforehand to parents or to guardians or whoever that you're going to talk about this stuff like you can't just talk about it like you would any other particular topic that's part of your your daily grind with your students right um, in Alberta it's part of the parental rights movement right uh, you know, again, there's a certain idea in Alberta that teachers are agents of the state and the state is, you know, untrustworthy and that, you know, we're endangering or corrupting our kids, uh, you know, their kids by teaching them, you know, about gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgendered things or, you know, if we talk about religion or if we you know ask a big religion question that is you know that might lead them to I don't know maybe question a something that is part and parcel of religious beliefs that they or their family harbor or something like that like you, in other words you know there's a great distrust here in Alberta of teachers because we are you know, suspicious, suspiciously part of the state that, you know, and Alberta is all about independence and, and individuality. And anyway, um, th this is something that you have to be aware of now. And it's a recent development in Alberta, but you have to be aware of it now uh, so that, you know, down the road, you don't get in trouble. Um, I don't know. I've, I've searched through and as of yet, I haven't seen any any cases come up in, in Alberta schools yet where teachers have been hung out to dry on this particular issue, but it's just a matter of time. Um, section 3 is interesting, though. It says, like, if it comes up incidentally, right? If s sexual things or if religious things come up in a classroom incidentally. Like, you didn't bring them up, but, you know, kid asks question, right? Or um, it's like a passing remark or something like that you, you know you can't be held you know over the fire for that but um if it's if it's explicit then you certainly can i guess this comes from um 2009 they had this thing bill 44 it, when it when it hit uh hit the news it was big news at the time um because lots and lots of teachers had serious concerns about Bill 44, this Human Rights Citizenship and Multiculturalism Amendment Act, right? Uh, the ATA exploded on it. Uh, they saw all kinds of dangers for, not just for teachers and landmines, like for teachers to potentially step on, but also like, well, what about, how's this going to affect um, not just freedom as a teacher to teach, but freedom of learners to learn right like I mean I'm an English teacher so for instance think about the implications for this um, I'm trying to teach Romeo and Juliet in grade 9 the kids in grade 9 are the same age as Juliet was Juliet um, is uh, a young unmarried girl uh, having sex out of wedlock being advised by a priest uh, who who uh, is corrupt um, so there's all kinds in other words there's all kinds of religion in this play 
There's all kinds of criticism of religion in this play. There's sexual content in this play. There's premarital sex in this play. There's people talking about raping, like, the, you know, the different gangs, the Montague and Capulet gangs, right? There's, there's all kinds of uh, dirty bits in the play. Um, one of the ways to make Shakespeare interesting for students is to point that kind of stuff out, right? You, you get them in, you invite them into the play to think about it, and you point out the biblical illusions, you point out the religious debates, you point out all these, but how am I supposed to do that now, right? Like, okay, well, um, you know, I mean, I, I, all I do now is I, I guess I announced that I'm teaching Romeo and Juliet, but here's all the, and so, but before you never, you never would have had to have done that, right? Same, same with, um, say Merchant of Venice, right? Like, I don't know if you've read Merchant of Venice, but two of the guys in there, Antonio and Bizzanio, they're, they're, they're gay guys, right? I mean, it's never said, hi, I'm Bazzano, I'm gay, hi. But it's it's all understated. Like, it's all under the current uh, homosexuality. And it's, 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 but these are the main characters, right? So, um, how do you deal with that then? I mean, it's, it's an important part. You can't really understand what's going on in the play without talking about, about that. And not only that, but then there's all this stuff about Shylock, the Jew, and the animosity between the Christians who hate him, all the anti-Semitism, and the Jew, and, the, you know, and so there's religion again. Or say you're a social studies teacher, right, and a bomb goes off over in Palestine. Or, or uh, you know, the Twin Towers, um, you know, you're in 2001, and the twin, you know, somebody attacks the Twin Towers. Or, or um, you know, you want to understand what's going on with these crazy buggers um, uh, in the Middle East, uh, you know, that are um, are destroying um, uh, you know uh, works of art and, and and heritage sites, world heritage sites, and you know all these um, uh, ISIS people. Well, how are you going to talk about any of that if you can't talk about religion? It's an explicit thing, so. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of problem with this law, and the ATA knew that, and lots and lots of people who are academics know that, and they've written about that, and there were warnings about that. But this bill comes out of this particular wing of concern for people who don't want their beliefs questioned. They don't want their beliefs. Um, you don't want teachers questioning their beliefs in front of their students. They, you know, they don't want they don't want their students asking questions that might, in you know, infringe upon their ability to teach their kids uh, what they consider to be the truth with regard to say human evolution, right, or creationism, or um, you know, sexual. Um, um, orientation or or anything like this so that's where all this comes from folks it, it's it's from that particular area so bill 44 then quickly turns into this human rights uh, act <coughs> and then um, this is the substance of it here um, it it you know it comes up in section 11.1 of the human rights citizenship and multiculturalism amendment act so, um, and then after that, that's where it spills in in 2015. It goes from 2009 and then 2015. It's, it's basically word for word pumped into the new school act in 2015. You see? So it's made its way through up the food chain, I guess, to, to there. You know, so again, like I just ask you, what does this do to free inquiry in our classrooms? What happens to free inquiry in matters of sexual education, sexual orient, or, uh, instruction, sexual orientation, religion, as well as grand philosophic questions that are at the heart of a current event you're studying or a work of literature, since these naturally lend themselves to religious and metaphysical wondering, right? Um, you know, big questions. Why are we here? Uh, what's the meaning of life? Um, you know, what is the ground of truth, or what is, you know, like, I mean, that's kind of a lofty, but you'll get questions like that from time to time, big, meaningful, philosophic, wondering questions. They always, always steer towards religious things, because religious language is, is, there's no better language than religious language to talk about the big, wondering questions of life, right? 
How are you going to talk about any, how are you going to have any depth in your investigations in it without being at, you know, your liberty to talk with your students freely and openly about things like sex or religion or philosophy? And it doesn't say philosophy, but obviously philosophy, I'm saying philosophy and metaphysics are intimately tied with religious questions. Okay? So here's an example of when this first came out in 2009 and I was teaching high school, I was listening to the news and I was like, oh, what the hell am I going to do? So, you know, at the beginning of the year, I just made up these waivers. And at that time, it was still Bill 44. It wasn't yet, um, it wasn't yet, you know, an official law. So, but I just, what I did was I cut and paste the official, you know, the, 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 um, the amendment act into the top portion there. You can read that. And then down below, I gave an expl an explanation of why I am choosing to do X, Y, or Z, right? Uh, and then what I would do down below that in the space provided, I would just write the names of the books that I was studying as an English teacher. So I would write Romeo and Juliet. I would write maybe The Merchant of Venice, or I would write, yeah, I mean, any of the other books that we would study in class together. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't get into all the sordid details of what happens in Romeo and Juliet and what happens in The Merchant of Venice. I mean, I'm saying this is what I'm studying. There's religious content here, right? It, it, I'm, I'm writing it here because it has some, uh, it has some relation to this new law that the province wants to have. And, you know what, if, if, if you want to grieve it, then I guess you should know something about Romeo and Juliet. So, you know, I'm leaving, I don't know whether it was copacetic, but I, I was leaving that to the parents. Why should I, you know, just point, like, is it, is it fair to Romeo and Juliet to just say, oh, well, you know, there's premarital sex and there's this and that and the other thing in there. Uh, and just, if, if you just give a gloss like that, it makes it sound like it's a piece of trash rather than the work of the classical work of literature that it is. So my my solution for that was just, here are the books, here are the poems, here are the movies or the film studies that we're doing, uh, and write that on there at the beginning of the year. Everything that we were reading, I'd, I'd write it on the bottom. I'd say, if you're interested, you know, uh, if you have a problem with any of this stuff, you know, then let me know. Uh, but I wouldn't get into the details of it because otherwise it's just like kicking a, you know, a hornet's nest, really. That was mine. Um, a few years later, I noticed that the Alberta government um, came up with its own waiver system. So you can find this. This is just the waiver that they have. It's kind of more formal. It's got fill in the blanks and stuff, right? Um, you could You could use that one rather than one like mine. But if you want that one, you can find it in the Guide to Education, ECS to Grade 12. So there you go. Okay, for some juicy stuff that you've been waiting for now. These are contracts of employment. Uh, these are all listed in sections 97 through to 103 in the uh, Alberta School Act. So, uh, contracts of employment. You should be aware that unless a teacher agrees, a board may not require a teacher to instruct students for more than 1,100 hours in a school year or for more than 200 teaching days in a school year. So that's that's something you want to... I guess, you know, there's somebody always doing the bean counting up top, so they're probably not going to make a mistake on that stuff, but you could keep your eye on it. Different contracts of employment. There's probationary contracts. So a first-year teacher is usually offered a probationary contract, which means that a position is available, and the board will consider offering a continuous or permanent contract the next year. First-year teachers may also be given a temporary contract. In fact, I would say a temporary contract is probably the one that you're going to be offered more than a probationary, honestly, which means that the uh, teacher is replacing a teacher on leave of absence, right? Maybe they got a, maybe it's a pregnancy leave or um, a sickness or a surgery or um, something like that, right? They left. The position will probably not be uh, vacant next year. A temporary contract expires either on the date stated or June 30th, whichever is later. A probationary contract expires June 30th. When the contract expires, there is no obligation for the board to offer you another contract. 
Therefore, if you haven't been offered another contract in writing, you don't have the job next year. So keep job hunting until you've signed, uh, have a signed contract. Even if the principal assures you they have a job next year, keep looking. The principal may be well-meaning, but principals don't hire teachers. Superintendents do. The offer is only good if it's in writing. So even if the superintendent verbally offers you a position, you don't have it until the paperwork is signed. That's right off the ATA website, folks. Um, and this is just the that section of the probation or the the school act. You can look at it. That's all about probationary contracts there. Okay, that's 1988. Then a continuing contract. There's not much on it, is there? But these are the, these are the ones you want at, at some point. Once you've got a continuing contract, you're you're in. It's like having tenure, right? So uh, a board may employ a teacher on a continuing contract. If the board has been employing the teacher either under a probationary contract or an extended probationary contract or under an interim contract and the board wishes to employ that teacher in the next school year and the teacher agrees, the teacher is on a continuing contract. If the board doesn't wish to employ such a teacher, it's not legally required to provide the teacher with reasons for that decision, assuming that it is acting in good faith. So, in other words, like, the thing you want to remember, temporary contracts basically lead nowhere, right? You can go from temp to temp to temp to temp to temp, and that happens. Uh, but once you get offered a probationary contract, if they want you for the next year, they got to hire you on, and if they hire you on after a probationary, you gotta, they got to give you a continuing. Or if they don't want you and they got to say bye bye okay um, so it, probationary is kind of a springboard to one of these guys in other words if the board doesn't wish to uh, employ the teacher it's not legally required to provide the teacher with reasons for that decision assuming that it is acting in good faith however it is morally obligated to do so a teacher in such a situation of genuinely ignorant of the reasons should request them from the superintendent the continuing contract is a contract that remains in force from year to year without any further documentation being required. Any teacher offered a contract that does not conform to this requirement should immediately consult an association staff officer prior to any action on the contract offer. So if a contract looks fishy and you can't figure out what it is, how where it folds in, then just go talk to the ATA. That's what the ATA is telling us here. Substitute teaching, you're going to be doing this probably. This is how I started. Substitute teaching is lots of fun too, folks. You'll, I think you'll really, you'll really enjoy it. It's a good win, way to start your teaching career. You'll see all different schools. You'll get to taste of what different schools are like and different school communities and different grades. And it's really, it, it can be really enjoyable. And it's not like you, you're not going to have relations with the kids. Like, if you keep going back to the same school as a substitute teacher, you, you'll, develop, um, you'll develop relations with the kids, which is really good. And they'll get to know you. So, a teacher may, under Section 100 of the Act, be employed, A, on a day-to-day -day basis, or B, to occupy a vacancy that's expected to be less than 20 consecutive teaching days. Uh, it frequently happens that a vacancy filled by a substitute teacher extends beyond 20 teaching days. In this event, a temporary contract, which provides 30 days notice of termination, should be provided. Okay, so if ever you're teaching, you're sub-teaching for more than 20 consecutive days, now you're on a temp contract, okay? And actually, one of the other things, I don't see that it comes up here, but um, and maybe it's not the same in every jurisdiction, but for instance, in the CBE, like if you're... If you're subbing uh, for more than five days in the same school uh, consecutively, you're not just paid, you know, your your basic four hundred some odd dollars for that day, and then the next day, and then the next day. You're not paid piecework like that. Like you actually get paid on the teacher grid. Uh, so the grid salary you get paid based on that. So that's that's pretty cool too. Um, which it, it's better, just so you know, it's better pay. It's not a drop in pay if you work. Uh, you know, more than five days uh, in a sequence. So it frequently happens... Uh, okay, so this is, yeah. When you get 20 more days in a row, that's a temporary contract. 
Um, whether or not a temporary contract comes into effect, most collective agreements provide that after a specified number of consecutive teaching days in the same position, salary changes, oh, here we go, from substitute pay uh, to that determined by the salary grid. A few agreements provide full grid placement from day one. So that's neat. Okay. There's the uh, section out of the School Act on substitute teaching. Temporary contracts. Again, this is probably one that you're going to find very common when you start out. Section 101 of the Act deals with temporary contracts. These are used when a teacher is employed to fill a vacancy expected to be 20 or more consecutive teaching days. This written contract must specify the starting date. It may specify the ending date, but if it does not, it ends on June 30th. So, you know, it's, it's more than 20 days, but not not like the full not like the full year right it's it's uh, just more than 20 days it could be almost the entire year except for you know a few days right it may be terminated earlier by either party giving 30 days notice to the other in this event there is generally uh, no appeal to the board of reference teachers are cautioned about temporary contracts that expire on the return of the teacher teachers should consult the association about implications of such clauses. So, you know, what if the teacher decides to come back earlier? Then you're screwed, aren't you? Right? So that's what the ATA is saying. Don't have that. Have a definite date when the thing starts and when it ends. Okay? And these interim contracts, I'm just going to read this to you. Uh, the interim contract is described in section 102. Although there's a suggestion that this was intended to provide for limited time projects, nothing in the Act restricts it to that purpose. Rather, it seems that the most common use will be for employing teachers uh, new to the system who start work after the year has begun. An interim contract can be for up to 360, 360 consecutive teaching days and may be offered only to the same individual who would also qualify for a probationary contract. It normally expires on June 30th, but a different date may be specified in the contract. A probationary contract may not immediately follow an interim contract, or vice versa, right? So, after each one of those, you got to have a either sent back to the, the bottom, or else um, you go to a um, continuous. Alright, well, here's a chart that I nabbed from... Uh, um, the teach Alberta Teachers Association. Um, this is just a, a, a chart that out, you know basically summarizes the different kinds of contracts there: probationary, interim, temporary, continuing, substitute, and then part time at the bottom there, and the different aspects of them. You can pause this slide and look at it uh, in greater detail if you'd like. Okay, these are the various kinds of gigs available, but what about your pay as a teacher in Alberta? Um, you, to get this, this will change, right? It'll be different depending on what school board, what school district, what school you're working at, also what collective agreement is in your area. But and, and it'll change through the years too, right? But anyway, here's just an example. Uh, this is the pay grid for Calgary Region schools, effective as of September 1st, 2015. Uh, I took it from um, uh, Alberta Teaching Association website again, right? So you can see how it works. The years of teacher experience are down the left-hand column. And then they count years of post-secondary education. So, um, you know, pretty much everybody, everybody has four years of uh, post-secondary who becomes a teacher, right? Um, in fact, I don't know. I think pretty much everybody has to have more than that now like even even if you do what's called a concurrent education program or like now at the University of Calgary they have you can decide fresh out of high school to go into uh, teaching uh, um, in Alberta um, I think it's still a five-year program but you know most of us I think because up until last year or whenever um, all the teaching um, programs in Alberta were two-year programs. Uh, pretty much everybody had six years. All right. So, in other words, when you start with zero years of experience, you're 
you're making 66 grand. That's pretty nice, hey? And, you know, up at 10, that's what you're making there, 101. So it's, teaching is a well-paid gig in Alberta. Honestly, I, um, um, I mean, I think that the discomforts of teaching aren't with pay at all. I think that probably the areas that are, are, are most troublesome from the point of view of teachers is, is things like class size, um, and especially, uh, you know, things like class size and preps too, prep time, right? Um, those are the things I think it would be nice to see teachers rally more around rather than uh, wage increases and salary increases and stuff. So, uh, but there, there you go. There's, there's the, there's the, um, the salary grid. And, um, you know, lots of um, private schools, they'll pay uh, on par with grid many will pay better than grid because while well, they're trying to attract you there but also they're like well you're not getting all the benefits like um, if you're ATA and you're working in a public school uh, you're paying into benefits so you're getting pension and you get oh, it's nice to have dental I haven't had dental in years uh, same like if you want to get your eyes fixed or like your kid gets sick and he or she needs medicine or something like I mean, they're not stellar, excellent, amazing, golden-plated packages by any means, but they, they're so, it's so nice to have that. Honestly, it's just, you're so lucky to be a teacher when you, you see that there are these things in there, and especially if you get into a public school, uh, because, I mean, again, uh, maybe you could make a fair bit more, you know, uh, salary-wise at a private school, but... There's no checks and balances on power there. Uh, there's, you know, basically you're on your own with regard to getting your teeth fixed, uh, or your eyes looked at, or your kids are... So, anyway, take it, take it with a grain of salt, but that's my advice to you. All right, so I hope that that lecture, it was incredibly long. I apologize, but, um, you know, it's, it's a lot to get through, and it was a good introduction for you, I hope, uh, to uh, teaching in Alberta and the Alberta School Act. Thanks for listening.